her fire for you personally from yesterday. We also have to be clear on who is responsible for each element of the opening. The president said last night that he has total authority for determining how and when states reopen. That is not an accurate statement, in my opinion. Now that we know that government actually matters and government is relevant and that government has to be smart because what government does is determining how this goes. It's literally determining, in many ways, life and death. We have to be smart about it. The federal-state relationship is central to our democracy. This has been a topic discussed since our founding fathers first decided to embark on this entire venture. This is basic federalism, the role of the states and the role of the federal government. And it is important that we get this right. Our founding fathers understood, and we have to remember today, that the balance between the state and the federal, that magnificent balance that is articulated in the Constitution, is the essence of our democracy. We don't have a king in this country. We didn't want a king. So we have a Constitution and we elect the president. The states, the colonies, formed the federal government. The federal government did not form the states. It's the colonies that ceded certain responsibility to a federal government. All other power remains with the states. It's basic to our Constitution and that federal-state relationship. Hamilton, who in many ways was representative of this discussion of the balance of power, state governments possess inherent advantages which will ever give them an influence and ascendancy, ascendancy, a beautiful word, over the national government, and will forever preclude the possibility of federal encroachments on the states. That their liberties indeed can be subverted by the federal head is repugnant to every rule of political calculation. Wow. Alexander Hamilton. I didn't realize that he was that smart. And I guess the governor today is becoming a historian. Towards enlightening all of us pertaining to this individual. I didn't realize that he was that smart. Liberties indeed can be subverted by the federal head. I didn't know that. Is repugnant to every rule of political I can't even pronounce that word. Wrong language. Let's back it up a little bit. Repugnant to every rule of political calculation. Str calculation. Every political calculation. In other words, it's debatable. But who, this is my question, who discerns the political uh, calculation? It's we the people. We the people is who decide the political calculation. I had to look at that. We the people are the people that design not only state government, not only local government, but federal government. We the people. And that's what Mr. Alexander Hamilton is saying there. Rule of political calculation. Who desires the rule? Who manufactures the rule? Who transpires the rule? We the people. 
and it's up to we the people in what we decide towards what is going to rule. And the same thing that ruled in his era pertaining to ideals, policies, how we're going to take care of things may be totally different today and how they rule. It's still going to be based upon the same core. We the people that's going to be doing the ruling. But our ideals, our concepts, uh, the, the entities have changed. The, the circumstances have changed. Everything has changed in comparison to what was going on then in comparison to what's going on today. But it still fulfills the same core. It still fulfills the same core, which is we, the people. And if we, the people, don't have a say-so in what is going on, then we, the people, are no longer in charge, but other people that we have put in charge are in charge. wrong language, but that was the premise. Uh, so there are laws and there are facts, even in this wild political environment. What do we do? We do what we do, because we are New York tough, but tough is more complex than many people think it is. Within that word, tough is smart and united and disciplined and loving. They are not, uh, they're not inconsistent to be tough and to be loving. Let me make a personal point, not necessarily a factual point. The president did his briefing last night, uh, and the president was clearly unhappy. Uh, the president did a number of tweets this morning where he's clearly unhappy, did a tweet about mutiny on the bounty and governors are mutineers. I didn't follow the exact meaning of the tweet, but the basic uh, essence of the tweet was uh, that he was not happy with governors and that this was a mutiny. Uh, the president is clearly spoiling for a fight on this issue. The worst thing we can do in all of this is start with political division and start with partisanship. Uh, the best thing we have done throughout this past 44 days is we've worked together and we haven't raised political flags. Even in this hyper-partisan environment, even though it's an election year, even though the politics is so intense, we said not here, not in this. This is too important for anyone to play politics. It was a no politics zone, right? This is just about doing the right thing, working together. Uh, and that's important and we have to stay there. We're all in a little bit of a reflective mood. I'm in a reflective mood. Uh, and everything we do here is so important and every day is so important. And I was thinking after the president made his comments and looking at some of the remarks and looking at the tweets, it reminded me of a poster I saw, saw when I was in grade school, St. Gerard Magella, Queens, New York, Catholic school, red blazer, gray pants, white shirt, little uh, clip on tie, the tie with the hook. Remember the hook tie that you had to put the hook on and then it looked like you had a real tie, which I never understood because the hook was harder to do. You had to hook and then you had to adjust the band, which was harder than just teaching a kid how to just tie the tie, it would have been easier. But I was in grade school and there was that poster uh, that came from a Sandberg poem, I think. Suppose they gave a war and nobody came. And I was looking at the poster and I didn't really get it because I, even then I was very literal. Suppose they gave a war and nobody came. So I'm looking at the poster and a priest came up behind me 
and said, what's wrong, Andrew? I said, I don't understand that. Suppose they gave a war and nobody came. How could that happen? Then you wouldn't have a war. He said, but that's the point. The point is what happened if, what would happen if people just refused to engage? They just refused to fight. And I still didn't get it because, and he said, you know, sometimes it's better to walk away from a fight than engage it. Sometimes it takes more strength, frankly, to walk away from a fight than engage it. The president will have no fight with me. I will not engage in it. I've sat here every day for 44 years asking New Yorkers to remember that this is not about me, it's about we. I understand you're personally con inconvenienced. I understand you're frustrated and stressed and anxious and you're feeling pain. Think about we. Think about get, get past yourself and think about society and think about your family and think about interconnection and act responsibly for everyone else. This is no time for politics and it is no time to fight. Uh, I put my hand out in total partnership and cooperation with the president. If he wants to fight, he's not going to get it from me, period. This is going to take us working together. We have a real exactly. challenge ahead. Exactly. Just because that, those numbers are flattening, it's no time to relax. We're not out of the woods. Right. In this reopening, we could lose all the progress we made in one week if right. we do it wrong. Right. Uh, and we have a number of challenges ahead. We have to figure out how to do this. How do you have a public health strategy that works with an economic reactivation strategy? Nobody has done this before. How do you start to increase the number of essential workers? How do you learn the lessons of the past? How do you start to do the massive testing that we're going to have to do here and that we don't have the capacity to do today? The capacity does not exist. The private sector companies that do testing, we can only get about 60,000 tests per month. That's not enough. We're going to do the antibody testing, but that's not enough either. Uh, how do we do this? Put together this whole testing system and do it in a matter of weeks. It is a real question. How do we use technology? Apple and uh, other companies are working on using technology to do tracking. How do we do that? And how do we do it fast? And how do we take all our strength and our collective strength and take this nation's collective strength and figure out how to do those challenges? 50 years ago this week, Apollo 13 gets damaged 220,000 miles from Earth. Somehow they figure out how to get a spaceship back 220,000 miles 50 years ago. That's America. Okay, figure out how to do testing. Figure out how to use technology to do tracing. That's what we have to work on. Right. Uh, and we have to do that together. Right. We have to do as a government what our people have done, right? Sometimes political leaders can learn best from following people who are normally ahead of the politicians. Right. Look at how people have been selfless and put their own agenda aside for the common good. Can't their leaders be as smart as they are? The answer has to be yes. Uh, so I look forward to working with the president in partnership and cooperation, but he has no fight here. I won't let it happen. Uh, and look, unless he he suggested that uh, we do something that would be reckless and endanger the health or welfare of the people of the state, then I would have no choice. Uh, and that's basically what they've done right here at 291 Thompson Road, Sharon, Tennessee. They was wanting me to get down onto their level to fight. Have a pissing contest in the middle of the road. And I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't going to do it for two reasons. Reason number one, 
they had not crossed that threshold to the point that they gave me no other choice. And number two, the reason why that I wouldn't do it is because I felt like that it was a setup. I felt like that it was an entrapment. Coming from the courts here in Weekly County, by allowing these incidences to continue to occur again and again and again and again. <clears throat> and I couldn't get Tommy Moore. We couldn't get Tommy Moore at the time to come down on what was happening here on this corner. So I scratched my head and I thought to myself, all right, I'm not going to engage in violence unless I just absolutely have to. If they come onto this property, similar towards what went on with my younger brother David Jeffrey Jackson during the time that Donald Ridgeway and Gail Ridgeway and their daughter, Kelly Sheffield, took my brother down on his own property and then took his own gun and put it to his head and tried to engage the gun pertaining to not just insulting him, but trying to kill him that once more carries a charge of 1 to 15 years. Not just reckless endangerment with the gun, but literally pointed the gun to his head and tried to discharge the gun three or four different times and the gun wouldn't go off. But if it reached that level to the point that they was foolish enough to come onto this property towards me having to protect this castle, that's whenever I would have engaged in some sort of hostility. Pushing or resisting against the hostility that I felt like that was coming against me. Especially at the point if I felt like that my life at that particular point in time was being endangered. Was in jeopardy. That's exactly what they tried to do here. They was trying every tactic you could think of. So that I would engage on the same level that they was on. And I'm like the governor here. Um, I, re I refuse to do it. I refuse to get on that same level of idiocy. Because I'm not just going to fight just for the pure reason to be fighting. Now, if there was a certain amount of money involved in the fight, then I may, I may tangle into a fight. Um, I'm kind of like a professional, I don't know what you would call it. I, I was going to use a, a certain illustration, but I felt like that that was the wrong illustration. But I'm not just going to fight just to be fighting because I don't have nothing to have to prove to nobody. Besides that, my Bible teaches me to love thy enemies and to be wise as serpents but harmless as doves. How harmless is a dove if that dove is out here fighting, engaging in violence? It's not a dove no more. I've never seen a dove get into a battle or get into a fight. So I would be violating my own teachings if I'd done what they was trying to drag me down in doing. That's the reason why I didn't fight. It's because I didn't feel like that I had to fight. They was not foolish enough to come onto the property. You know, you can get out in the road and you can scream and yell and you can call me names and you can do whatever you want to do as long as you're out there in the road. But now whenever you come onto this property, Especially if you come on to my dwelling place where I live, pertaining to my porch or my, my castle. Then 
is a completely different story. Then is whenever I'll do what is necessary to protect my castle and to protect my very life. It never did reach that point. If it did, if it did, then I would have had to have reconsidered my tactics. But shy of that, I put my hand out to say, let's do this together. Questions? Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Come here. Come here. Come These are specific homes of Ohio and Connecticut. You scream first. You don't have the same endurance. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> but screaming first matters. Governor, Go ahead, you, you're talking right now about making peace with Donald Trump, with the president, and yet you went on television four times this morning and were asked about it and opined about it repeatedly. You called him a king. You said that his press briefings were like a comedy sketch. Why didn't you just say no comment if you're trying to make peace with him? No, the first point is he does not have total authority. I mean, I'm a governor of a state. Uh, the statement that the he has total authority over the states and the nation cannot go uncorrected. I mean, it's just a factual statement that is factually wrong. Tenth Amendment to the Constitution is a whole body of case law. Uh, I mean, there are many things you can debate in the Constitution because they're ambiguous. This is not one of those things that is ambiguous. So that... That would be like saying that he was the Lord or that he was God. And he's not a spiritual guidance counselor or a spiritual leader. He's only a president, a political president over a certain amount of people. It's only God who sits on the throne that's to be reverenced as God. The Lord who sitteth upon the right hand of God that maketh intercession prayer should be reverenced as the Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Donald Trump is on some sort of different hemisphere to the point that I really think that he thinks that he's some sort of a god or possible some sort of a king. And by watching his actions and how he, how he presents himself and, and the things that he says and, and the, how he approaches the, the general public, and how he approaches other people that, that's got power too, I think is transparent in what I'm talking about towards it being truthful. Even the governor said just now that some of the things that Donald Trump says has to be corrected in his ideology because he is not a god. He is not a king. We do not live under a kingmanship. Something has happened to Donald Trump to the point that his thinking is not reasonable. And other people have detected this. And now that they're cornering him up towards being accountable for what he didn't do, this is the way that he's responding. He's responding in a, I think, in an unintelligent way, especially if he wants to get reelected in a second term. And I think eventually the people's going to be able to see through this idiotic behavior, this idioticacy that, that he is uh, uh, transforming to the people that is coming out in a very, very negative way. And, it, and if it's happening, and if this governor right now that can understand that and see that pertaining to his ideology about himself, if this governor can see that and understand that, don't you think that other people can too as well? Well, sure they can. Sure they see it. Now, whether or not they care about it or not, I don't know. But I'm kind of like them. Those that can see it. 
He's not a king. He's not a god. He's not a lord. He's a president over a certain group of people, which limits his powers. I'm just a subservient unto the Lord. Just because I'm a subservient unto the Lord does not make me the Lord. I'm only a speaker for the Lord. I'm a subservient for the Lord. I'm in a spiritual arena. Donald Trump and this governor is in a political arena. A man-made arena. There's a difference between the two different arenas. That statement cannot stand. And it's not only violative of the Constitution, it's violative of the very concept of democracy. I mean, this was the first battle. Do we want a king or do we want a president? And we opted for a president. So that statement cannot stand, period. Attacks, uh, you know, calling him a king, saying that he's, it's like a comedy sketch, saying. No, that's not a, It is. His, his proclamation is that he would be king. That's what a king is. A king has total authority. That statement cannot stand. The whole mutiny on the bounty, the governors are mutineers, whatever that means, uh, and whatever the rest of the theory was. Uh, I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to get into that uh, fight. Look, I bent over backwards. He took a, said a nasty comment about what it was, but he's right. Uh, I worked very hard to be in partnership with the federal government this past month. Uh, I worked very hard to stay away from politics. Uh, and he is right. I did call and say I need federal assistance. I did call and say I need uh, possible overflow beds. That uh, he is right that he did move uh, very quickly to get us Javits and the U.S. in his comfort. And I said that repeatedly. And I praised him for his actions. And he was right there too. Uh, the federal government has a very important role. I was a cabinet secretary. I did it for eight years. I know how key the federal government is. Frankly, I know how powerful they actually could be in being of assistance. And I don't even think they uh, were as powerful as they could be. And the federal government has tremendous, tremendous capacity that we need now. So, yes, he's right on all of that. He's right that we asked for... We need that now if it is channeled in the right direction. We need that now if it is harnessed and used for the right benefit of the people. Not for the benefit of a king. Not for the benefit of somebody that thinks that he or she has some sort of a throne to defend. Yes, we do need that type of authority to help to pull together, to unify the nation. And this is something that has been lacking in this administration ever since he's become in power towards pulling people together, pulling the Democrats with the Republicans so that we can become united in defeating these challenges that we have, regardless whether it's a financial challenge regardless whether it's a uh, foreigner challenge pertaining to Iran or Iraq, or the challenge pertaining to the illegal immigrants, or the challenge pertaining to making sure that we had not just free trade, but fair trade. And now, of course, the challenges has come up pertaining to a disease. We need these type of challenge. We need these type of powers to be using for the benefit of the people, not for the benefit of one person, not for the benefit of somebody's own personal kingdom. Kind of like what he done with the Ukrainians. He was way out of step whenever he done what he done with the Ukrainians, according to our Constitution. 
Even one of our own Tennessee senators said what he done was wrong. But we didn't feel like that it was impeachable, is what they come up with their final analogy. Well, if that's not impeachable, what the heck is impeachable? And I personally believe that because of these illegitimate decisions that has been made by our state Congress has put us in the precarious position that we're in right now, not just with the coronavirus, but in every other aspect of what's going on. Because once more, they haven't been pulling for the will of the people. They've been pulling for the will of themselves. Which is the very opposite of what our forefathers, the builders, intended to do. That sat down and had a part in making this all work pertaining to our democracy for cooperation and assistance. And he's right that he delivered. And I've said that all along. But this mutineers and, uh, it can't exist. Why does the state listen to the name of nursing homes and how many COVID cases and fatalities are there? I don't have anything specific to talk to him about. See, Donald Trump thinks that anybody that disagrees with him fits under the category of a mutineer. Who is forming a mutiny against him. What Donald Trump don't realize is that just because Donald Trump come up with the ideal doesn't necessarily mean, first of all, that it's the right ideal. And second of all, it doesn't necessarily mean because he come up with the ideal that that's the ideal that the majority of the people want to pull towards. I think that's the, that's the part there, the mind block that's happening with him. That he feels like, because he's the one that come up with the ideal, that first of all, it's the right ideal. And second of all, he feels like that because he's the one that come up with the ideal, everybody should pull along with his ideal. Once more, he's not a king. The people did not elect a king. They elected a president. He is not some sort of a spiritual advisor representing the kingdom of God. He represents the will of the people. He don't represent the kingdom of God. His mind is confused towards what position that he should hold in the eyes of the people. That really and truly, if the truth be known, don't have nothing to do with God other than his personal relationship that he may or may not have with God. And everybody is entitled to that regardless whether they be the President of the United States or they be a dictator in some tyranny-type country that is being run like a king. Even a king had a right in what type of relationship that he felt like that he had with his maker. Even though he was a king for the people rather than a king for God, a king for the Almighty. See, whenever Jesus come onto the scene, he represented the Almighty. That's the reason why Jesus said again and again and again, for if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He was just like a lawyer representing a client. Jesus was, was put in a position to where he was basically a representative for God Almighty. And God honored his position because it was God that sent him down here to begin with. That's the reason why that he was either half man or half divine or all man or all divine, depending upon what way that you looked at it, because he come here in a supernatural form. Mary did not have a biological husband. She did not have a biological boyfriend. She was superseded into a pregnancy by a supernatural being, by an angel that was chosen, that chose Mary, that was in favor of God at the time. That's the reason why Jesus was the actual Son of God. 
literally speaking, not figuratively speaking, but literally speaking. And because his authority infuriated or intimidated various people, that's the reason why they wanted him dead. The very same reason to this day that if you have an anointing on your life, regardless whether you be someone like myself or someone in another faraway country, if you have an anointing on your life to do something for the holy, righteous, eternal God, odds are you're probably going through great persecution right now. And in some incidences, your life is probably in danger. If not, your life will be in danger because they're crucifying true Christians every day, killing them overseas. Every day. Every day. It don't matter if you're in China. It don't matter if you're in Pakistan. It don't matter if you're in Afghanistan. It don't matter if you're in Iran. It don't matter if you're in Iraq. If, you're a, if you are a true Christian with a true anointing on your life, your life is in danger. The persecution of the, of the martyrs. Every day. Because Satan is still ruling. Satan is the prince of this world. And Satan works within the majority of the people that's on this planet right now. Satan is the prince of this world. That's the reason why all this hardship has fallen up onto the Windmill Ministries here at 291 Thompson Road, Sharon, Tennessee, zip code 38255. They're not picking and proking and, and, and doing me the way that they're doing me because I'm a bank robber, because I'm a rapist. They're not out here picking and poking and wanting to make fun of me and wanting to stir up fights and stuff with me because I beat them on a car deal or I have uh, tried to get fresh with any of their wives or, or steal any of their daughters away from them. They're not out here because because I, I'm, I'm noted of, of uh, doing horrible, horrible things to children or being a, a cold-blooded massacre murderer. These people are attacking the founder of the Windmill Ministries because of righteousness sake. And that's the part that they don't get. That's the part that they choose not to want to accept. That they're still in denial of. Kind of like our king. If you want to call him a king, King Trump. He thinks he's a king. He is not a king. The people did not elect a king. They elected a president. He is a president over a certain group of people that has to take his powers and equally distribute them out between other people that has powers too as well. Regardless whether it be governors, senators, congressmen, he is not a king. He is not a god. He don't even represent God. He represents the people. That's the part that the governor is talking about right now, that obviously something has occurred. I'm going to back it up real quick. That way you get the full story. Today? Let's back it up. Let's back it up. Back it up. Back it up. Stop it right there. I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to get into that uh, fight. Look, I bent over backwards. He took a, said a nasty comment about what it was, but he's right. Uh, I worked very hard to be in partnership with the federal government this past month. Uh, I worked very hard to stay away from politics. Uh, and he is right. I did call and say I need federal assistance. I did call and say I need uh, possible overflow beds. That uh, he is right that he did move uh, very quickly to get us Javits and the USNS Comfort. And I said that repeatedly. And I praised him for his actions. And he was right there too. 
the federal government has a very important role. I was a cabinet secretary. I did it for eight years. I know how key the federal government is. Frankly, I know how powerful they actually could be in being of assistance. And I don't even think they uh, were as powerful as they could be. And the federal government has tremendous, tremendous capacity that we need now. So, yes, he's right on all of that. He's right that we asked for cooperation and assistance. And he's right that he delivered. And I've said that all along. But this mutineers and uh, it can't exist. Why did the state listen to the name of nursing homes and how many COVID cases of fatalities are I don't have anything specific to talk to him about today. Uh, there's no action item uh, for us to talk about. Did you talk to him after what's been going on? I don't have no, it'd be my pleasure to speak with him, but we don't have anything that is. Uh, do we have anything pending? No. I did speak to the White House this morning about a uh, hospital matter. Uh, but other than that, we don't have anything immediate. No, we haven't had that conversation. And look, it, this is a shift in federal position, which is also fine, by the way. We're entering a new phase, the quote-unquote reopening phase. On the first phase, which was the close-down phase, the president took a different tact. The president did not close down the economy. He did do the travel ban with China, and he was right on the travel ban with China. The close down of the economy was left to the governors. And I closed exactly. down New York. Uh, Governor Pritzker closed down Illinois. Governor Lamont closed down Connecticut. Did it different times, different ways. But he, he uh, left that responsibility, the closing down of the economy, to the governors. A matter of fact, California was about a week ahead of New York. And because California was a week ahead of New York, California has had many, many less problems and many less fatalities than New York, the state of New York. Why? Because the governor took it upon to themselves of saying, we're canceling. Just like the ball games, the football games, the baseball games, uh, the basketball games, these people took it upon to themselves of saying, we're canceling this. The school system, we're canceling this. These are people that take on highly responsible duties. They will be held accountable in the eyes of the courts and in the eyes of the people. And because of it, they worked swiftly to get things done. They didn't have to sit around and wait for a king to order them to do certain things. That's what Donald Trump don't understand. He is a president, not a king. We work in a democracy. We debate things. We talk about things. And just because you debate somebody doesn't give you the right to put them under the category of being a, a of a, a mutiny, a mutiny, a mutator, or a whatever the word that they was using a while ago. You know that would be like me going to the church that I went to yesterday simply to talk to the minister about his decision that he made about me about three months ago, and then all of a sudden I override the minister's decision. And I say, okay, I'm going to rebel. And he looks at me and says, how are you going to rebel? And I go, I'm going to worship with you anyway. I'll be here Sunday to worship with you. In other words, I would try to overpower 
the minister of that church. And there's no doubt the minister of that church has a right to his opinion that I went to yesterday over in Union City. He's got a right to think and believe the way that he thinks and believes. Just like I do not have a right to overpower that minister. If he believes the same way that I believe, hallelujah. And if he don't believe the same way that I believe, according to the Bible that I go by, tells me to shake the dust off of my feet and move on. And that's exactly what I've been doing now for 30 plus years. All these people that did not want to support uh, biblical Bible prophecy in regards to the message that the, that the messenger has been putting out to the general public now for 30 plus years. They've had their choices. They could have gotten in behind the, min the windmill ministries. They could have supported the ministry which supported worldwide peace, utopia, love, grace, all the etc. But they didn't want to do that. They wanted to snigger. They wanted to make fun. They wanted to, to ridicule. They wanted to demonize. They wanted to dehumanize. And now they're guilty of that. At Broad, in the area, in the neighborhood. If you want to call it a neighborhood, I call it a village, a settlement. Because a neighborhood builds together. Pulls together. These people didn't want to pull together. So these people obviously didn't want true peace. They wanted a so-called peace. They wanted a peace that looks appealing in the eyes of man, not a true peace in the eyes of God pertaining to the covenant of peace. And they're guilty. And now that they're guilty, they're still wanting to point their finger at me. No, no, no. No. The ministry did not fail the people. The people failed the ministry. Once more, I'm in a different position than what Donald Trump's in. I don't represent the people. I represent God. And I represent the things that's in the Bible pertaining to God. And I represent the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm an advocate for Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Just like Jesus Christ of Nazareth is an advocate for us that setteth upon the right hand of God, who maketh intercession prayer. For if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. We have an attorney that sits on the right hand of God. For if we sin, Jesus is standing there, appealing, please God, don't kill them. Please God, don't send them to hell. Please God, be merciful. Why these churches can't understand that and why people don't understand the difference between a president that represents the people versus a man of God that represents the kingdom that is not an actual king, but he does represent the kingdom. Why they cannot understand that, I don't know. It's got to be some sort of mind collapse. It's got to be some sort of, I don't know. It's, it's got to be some sort of fictitious thing that, that Satan has bamboozled them by to the point that they just believe the way that they believe and that's the way that they're going to believe and obviously you can't help a hopeless individual that, that's not willing to open up their eyes and, and understand uh, truthful matters, kind of like Donald Trump. Donald Trump is going to believe the way that he believes and people like me and you and everybody else can speak until we're black and blue in the face, but he's still going to believe the way that he believes under these circumstances that are obvious on a day-to-day -day level that continue to materialize the way that they're materializing by seeing his actions and, and the things that he says. Just because we as a society over here in America disagree with our president does not make us uh, mutators. We are not a mutiny trying to overthrow the government. That's not how our democracy was designed. Our democracy was designed that we can agree to disagree 
but at the same time, the government is supposed to be pulling for the will of the people. Because the government was elected by the people. For the people. That's who Donald Trump is supposed to be representing. He's not representing that kingdom. He's not representing God Almighty. He's not representing a king. He's representing the people. There's something wrong with Donald Trump's thinking for him to lash out the way that he lashes out towards thinking that he's some sort of a... Uh, he thinks he's some sort of a king. And this has been brought out many, many times way before this coronavirus ever set in over here in America. This isn't the first time that this has been brought out this way. It's some sort of an internal sickness that Donald Trump is struggling with. I don't know if he's on an ego trip. I don't know if he's a narcissist. The, everything surrounds him. You know, if you'll take a lot of, if you'll pay a lot of attention to a lot of the things that I say, instead of saying I, 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 I usually say we. We want this. We like this. We prefer this. We've done this. We suggest this. Because I'm representing the kingdom of the saints, not only that has lived and died before now, but representing the saints that are living today and the saints that possibly will live tomorrow. So I just don't speak for myself. I speak for all of us. I speak for the whole, the masses. Donald Trump, it's about I. I've got the power. I'm calling you down on this, Mr. Governor. I think you're forming a mutiny. It's, it's sad, the position that we're in right now with this president. You get to the reopening of the economy, well, the governor's closed it down. Wouldn't the governor's reopen it? The president says, no, I, I have a different model that I'm envisioning. That's okay, too. But it's a shift. But it's okay. But then what is that model? And let's talk about who does what, which is the intelligent conversation we have to have. How do we do this testing? How does that come up to scale? I can't do it. How do we do this technology? And I understand he's right, it raises constitutional questions. And do you really want that cell phone in your pocket to be a tracking device, right? Uh, okay, so let's talk through how we do that. How do we disinfect a public transit system? Uh, that has to be understood. How do we have masks for every New Yorker? How do we do that? How do we get uh, 10, 20 million masks. So we have that added protection. How do we get gloves? Uh, how do we make sure, God forbid, there's a second wave where there's another uptick that we have the medical equipment we need after we just went through this horrendous hurry up exercise? By the way, where's the funding for states to help do this? Exactly. I'm broke. Exactly. You know, there's no fancy way to say that. We exactly. have a $10 billion dollar deficit. Well, the state should do this and do this and do this and do this. I don't have two nickels to rub together. Right. And the past federal legislation didn't give us anything. Right. The only thing it gave the states was some Medicaid money. It doesn't give us anything to do any of this. They talked about it in the next legis uh, package of legislation, if there is one. But that's the intelligent conversation to have. Will now, will he, will he, will he have this conversation with you? Yeah, I, mean, I have always had an open line of communication with him. I mean, there have been times in the past when uh, he hasn't been happy with me and I haven't been uh, uh, throw, throwing bouquets to him, but we've always communicated and I'm sure we'll communicate now. But I just want to make my position clear I am not going to fight with him. I don't want, this is no time for any division with, between the federal government and the state government. And, and the governors who I work with, 
Democrats, we, Republican governor in Massachusetts, it's not a political conspiracy. Uh, governor Baker is a Republican. This is not about Democratic or Republican. It's just not. This is about New York, 10,000 lives lost. These were not 10,000 Democrats or 10,000 Republicans. These were 10,000 people. Exactly. Buried. Exactly. Forget the darn politics. Everyone's tired with it. Right. Why did you say that we see the names of nursing homes and how many COVID cases and fatalities are specific homes like Ohio and Connecticut's doing? Legal experts say, say that there's no HIPAA issue here. Okay. You want to speak to that, Dr. Jim? We put out the nursing home death data by county yesterday, and as you could see, some of them had one case. What we're worried about is personal privacy protection working with the Department of Health. There's more than, uh, there's about 600 nursing homes in the state. This goes for hospitals as well. There's some very small hospitals where they report out one or two deaths a day. We just want to go through the data and make sure we're not releasing any potential personal information, and as soon as that's done, that will be made available for people. So that's why we put the aggregate numbers out by county. That's what we're going through. Well, I think there are specific outbreaks at different nursing homes, so it's hard to tell. But you know, what are, where are, is, are there any nursing homes in particular that the state's seeing a huge problem? We're, we're seeing issues, like I talked about yesterday, in hospitalizations in different parts of the state we look at. We look at total beds being used. We look at deaths. We look at all of that. In certain downstate parts of the region, um, New York City and the outer boroughs and Nassau County, we have seen increased cases, but that has gone across the board, whether it be hospitalizations or nursing homes as well. So that's now part of the county data that you do see. Yeah, earlier you said that there's been 60,000 cases that you guys have the capacity to do a month. But so one, is that true? 60,000 a month. But then Mayor de Blasio said that they're going to start being able to do 100,000 tests a week. 50 homegrown, 50,000 homegrown efforts, 50,000 purchased from an Indiana company. So how does that coordinate with state efforts? And again, is that 60,000 capacity correct? The uh, signed on the dotted line, what's happening with the testing companies is the same thing that happened with medical equipment, PPE and ventilators. There are just a handful of companies that produce the private tests. And they're all private tests, by the way. A handful of companies that do it, and now every state is going to those companies to buy the tests. I've spoken to the head of the uh, several companies myself, and they have a limited production, and now they have to allocate it to 50 states. And we're again in a bidding war competition with other states. I would say to the federal government, you take that piece. Don't replicate the 50-state pandemonium. You want to talk about an increased federal role. Let FEMA do the testing. Right. FEMA right. should have, in my opinion, right. done all the purchasing of the medical equipment. Right. And they should have allocated it. Right. Why am I now competing for private testing capacity and exactly. private testing machines with Illinois and California? Exactly. How do I get out of the uh, eBay competition business for vital medical equipment and now vital testing? I would say to the president, you take it. God bless you. Because you have different bids and different promises from companies to different governments all across the country. Like, it basically turns into a cutthroat industry to where you got one state that's cutting another throat state because they can overbid. They got more power. They got more resources that they can overbid this state. And it turns into a free-for-all. Why would have anybody that was in a federal position have ever asked for that to have occurred to begin with? That's anti-productive. The problem is trying to serve the needs of the people. Not for governors to get in a, a, a dispute towards who's got the more resources and who can bid out the better price for the better breathing machine versus another state. That is absolutely insane. That is insane. You talk about being anti-productive. 
that's just about as anti-productive as you get because the next thing you know, the very company that could have got the machine for $25,000 a machine, now, because it got jacked way up, now they're having to give $28,000, $32,000, dollars for a machine. You talk about something that's contrary to the will of the people. That is contrary to the will of the people, especially whenever you could have got the same machine for $25,000. That's what he's talking about here. It's mishandled from the upper end, from the federal end. And then Donald Trump wants to put out slurring remarks to these governors and tell these governors that they're, mu they're mutinous. They're trying to start a mutiny towards trying to overthrow the federal government. This isn't about a mutiny. This isn't about Democrats or Republicans. This is about the needs of the people. This is about a crisis that subjectively has been brought upon to the people. Lord God, whenever it comes to being accountability, can't somebody see through this, this uh, smoke of Mira and 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 hazes towards what's going on here pertaining to the federal government? You know, the exact same thing happened in Katrina. If you really think about it, the exact same thing, because it was up to that administration to pull together the resources that was supposed to help those poor people that were stranded on their homes begging for help down in Louisiana. And instead, FEMA taking charge of the situation down there, that they had to go through all this crazy red tape, the governor of the state of Louisiana had to give a green light of telling the volunteers that if you go after somebody and they fall into the water and drown, you will not be held liable or responsible for their death. Please go. Do the great Samaritan thing that you're called upon to do towards being volunteers and go rescue the people. In other words, the governor of the state of Louisiana and I guess in certain cases in Mississippi too as well had to override FEMA, which is a federal organization. It is a federal institution under the guidelines of the president had to override a lot of the decisions and say, we don't care. FEMA's not here. FEMA's not in charge. FEMA's not doing the right thing. And because they're not doing the right thing, we're going to do the right thing. And that's whenever the governor told all them poor people that was stranded on them tops of those houses because they literally had to climb through the attic and then uh, dig holes into the... To the uh, outer layers of the roof and they was up there stranded on top of the roofs while their houses was submerged in 10, 12, 14 some places 20 foot of water depending upon how low of a lying area that there was but it was people that were stranded that needed help and they didn't need help after the red tape was over with they needed help then yesterday, today, now and it's running into the same type of situation. It's unbelievable how that the powers at bay that we thought was in place to take care of we the people, because what is going to happen if there's another catastrophe? And it may not be the same type of catastrophe. It may not be in the form of a disease. It may be in the form of an earthquake. It may be in the form of a volcano erupting up in Yellowstone National Park. It may be in the form of, of a meteor that falls from the sky doing 24,000 miles an hour the size of Texas that creates another uh, disaster, another catastrophe. What if? We have to ask ourselves the question, what if, if we can't handle what we're handling today pertaining to FEMA and the Corps of Engineers, what would we do if something really, really major happened to society? We would just be left on our own. 
And that's not what we the people elected to do. We the people elected a government to take care of us during a time of a catastrophe like this. So there is some questions that really need to be answered and there are some issues that really need to be looked at in a positive, pragmatic way so that we can be prepared possibly for the next disaster or possibly for the next doom and gloom that could be looming over all of our heads into the future. Like I bought 17,000 ventilators and then I didn't get, uh, we only got about 3,000, 2,500. The same thing's going to happen with the testing. The city can get 50,000 made a well, week. That's the what, can. Well, they're told that from a company. Do I believe we're going to see those numbers actually produced? No, because I think the same thing is going to happen that we just went through for the past month where those companies are going to get oversubscribed, they're then going to bid up the price, and it's going to go to the highest bidder. We learned this lesson. I saw this movie. I just lived it for the past month. It cost taxpayers tremendous amounts of money. Private companies got very rich. You want to talk about going to a new phase with a different model? Let's inform it from the past model. Tell FEMA you buy all the tests for the country, allocate them by need. Absolutely. This is where the cases are. New York, your X percent of the cases. Illinois, your Y percent of the cases. Massachusetts, your Z percent of the cases. The federal government is going to buy them, and then the federal government is going to allocate them. Not this, you know, let's, let's give each government or level of government functions that they perform best. And one of the really painful lessons was all this crazy competing by states and cities for medical equipment. We're going to, we're going to do that again? Right. That makes no sense. So there are going to of the serological tests, and what's the plan if those can't get scaled up in the way that you think is needed to reopen? What is the ac accuracy so, we're saying? Some, it varies. There are many different tests there. We're looking at the tests that have, you know, over 95% accuracy. We were working to scale this up both by our public lab, which is our state lab, the private sector uh, labs that are out there. We're looking at those as well as the hospitals, which have labs as well. And how do you address the false positive issue? Because if someone goes back to work, but they don't actually have the antibodies like the test says, and then that creates its own problem. Well, we are looking at that. For example, our state lab, the test that we've developed is basically six standard D deviations out, which basically means that you're really way up there over the 99% uh, accuracy, if not higher. Uh, but you are right, can I just follow up? You are right. There are different private sector tests with different accuracy rates. And that's one of the other complications. Go buy tests. Or whose test, which test, what level of accuracy, uh, and that, I think, it's something we have to figure out one way or the other, but I would say that's something the federal government should take. So what's the capacity on that at this point? How many antibody tests can you do? You mentioned a couple of thousand, right? So right? the state we are will be by next week at 2,000 um, tests that we will be able to do uh, per week at, at that, um, right, at that point. Um, uh, no, sorry, 2,000 tests uh, per day uh, next week, yes. That still seems like a long way to go in a but, state but, of 19 million people. Though, right, right, but that's that part. But we are also working with some of the private sector companies to be able to get in the tens of thousands of tests, as well as the hospitals. Several hospitals have developed tests. There are different ways to do these tests. You could do it as a blood test. Uh, we are looking at a, a, a finger stick test as well, um, where you just do a little blood spot, uh, and there's technology uh, for that as well. Yeah, but just uh, follow up on that for a second. It, it, look, you could have a whole symposium on testing. There are two types of tests, the antibody test and the diagnostic test. The antibody test, state health department has a test, and you're right, it's their limited capacity. Let's say they can do, you said 2,000 a day, so let's say 14,000 a week. What is 14,000 a week going to do for you? And by the way, the whole anti, what can the antibody population really be in the scope of things, right? Antibody population, people who had the illness and have recovered. Okay, that's important to know. 
and we're very aggressive on antibody testing, but how many people are going to test positive, right? What percent of the population at this point do you think had the coronavirus? What could a number be? 20%. 20%? 10%? Okay, you want to find that 10%, 20%, but then that's not enough to restart and get back to normalcy. That diagnostic test is going to be key. And now, think of the volume on that diagnostic test. We're 19 million people. How many diagnostic tests do you want to buy for 19 million people? And then multiply that by the nation. Look at the need. And I'm telling you, you literally have a handful of private sector companies that do this now. Right. Well, how do you scale that up? I don't know. How did you get a rocket ship 220,000 miles back from the moon 50 years ago? But if you could figure that out, you can figure this out. Uh, and if the federal government wants to know a valuable role, this is going to be a key element to all of this. You basically talk about testing everybody for coronavirus in the entire state as a prerequisite to getting the No, 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 no. No, you would never get there. If you, if you said that was the prerequisite, you'd be closed to ad infinitum. But you want testing capacity as a tool where businesses can use it as a tool. You want temperature taking, right? You open up a business, they're going to say, I want to take everybody's temperature as they walk in the door. All right, how do you take the temperature of uh, 500 people walking into a, a business, you know? Uh, just think of all the things you have to do. And then divide it between the federal government and the state government. We have to clean all the buses and all the trains. We want to clean all the park benches. We want to have a disinfectant solution where we have a cleaning protocol that we've never had before. We want the technology to do the tracing once we find the person who is positive and we can retrace them through the technology. How do we balance that with individual liberties? There's a, a lot to do here. And let's, the states cannot do this on their own. I'm not shy about capacity. I'm very proud of what we do in the state government. When I tell you I can't do something, it's the first time you've heard me say that since I've been governor. But I'm telling you, we can't do this, Joseph. Um, earlier, when this entire thing started 40 some odd days ago, you had said that COVID and North Governor Andrew Cuomo today saying that the state cannot do it on its own, but saying that the president is not king, saying that he is not spoiling for a fight with President Trump, but saying that if the president ordered him to do something like reopening too early, something that he said would be irresponsible, then he would fight. But he said that he does not want a fight with the president on this ongoing feud, if you will, between the White House and the governors, the Democratic governors in particular, Cuomo also pointing out that the Massachusetts governor, Governor Baker, is a Republican and that the governors are united in believing that they have to be the people in charge, which is constitutionally mandated, of when their states reopen. Also talking about testing and when the state would be ready and what it would require. A lot of very important details coming, but first, here in Washington, two presidents are indeed making news at this hour. President Trump meeting with recovered coronavirus patients at the White House who have all been tested today to make sure that they are safe as the administration is fiercely defending its response to the pandemic. The president lashing out at reporters last night during his briefing, at one point playing a produced video widely viewed as propaganda from the White House podium, a video that mimicked his campaign ads with selective, selective mix of bipartisan praise for the president then falsely asserting that he has total authority over governors to order the nation back to work, that which Governor Cuomo and others are pushing back on today. And today, former President Obama, from his home in Calarama, a video, a video that he tweeted out and put out on Facebook, officially endorsing Joe Biden after having stayed out of the Democratic primary race since it began with two dozen contenders. More than a year ago, in some cases, Bernie Sanders' enthusiastic endorsement just yesterday, clearing the way for Barack Obama, the party's most popular figure, to weigh in today. Joe gets stuff done. Joe helped me manage H1N1 and prevent the Ebola epidemic from becoming the type of pandemic we're seeing now. He helped me restore America's standing and leadership in the world 
on the other threats of our time, like nuclear proliferation and climate change. Joe has the character and the experience to guide us through one of our darkest times and heal us through a long recovery. And I know he'll surround himself with good people, experts, scientists, military officials, who actually know how to run the government. Right. And care about doing a good job running the government. And know how to work with our allies. And who will always put the American people's interests above their own. Now, Joe will be a better candidate for having run the gauntlet of primaries and caucuses alongside one of the most impressive Democratic fields ever. Each of our candidates were talented and decent, with a track record of accomplishment, smart ideas, and serious visions for the future. And that's certainly true of the candidate who made it farther than any other, Bernie Sanders. Bernie's an American original, a man who has devoted his life to giving voice to working people's hopes, dreams, and frustrations. He and I haven't always agreed on everything, but we've always shared a conviction that we have to make America a fairer, more just, more equitable society. We both know that nothing is more powerful than millions of voices calling for change. And the ideas he's championed, the energy and enthusiasm he inspired, especially in young people, will be critical in moving America in a direction of progress and hope. And joining me now in the All-Star panel, NBC White House correspondent, Weekend Today co-host Peter Alexander, Washington Post White House Bureau Chief Phil Rucker, NBC correspondent Mike Nemely covering the Biden campaign, former 2012 Obama campaign manager Jim Messina, and former Obama White House Deputy National Security Advisor Ben Rhodes. Uh, Mike Nemely, let me go to you first. What does this mean to Joe Biden? Uh, it was long in coming throughout the primaries. He felt, and I guess the Biden campaign also felt, that they had to wait till Bernie Sanders had come to peace with his own, his own can candidacy as well. That's exactly right, Andrea. Well, as Joe Biden himself just tweeted in response to President Obama's endorsement, you know, means the world to him and to Jill, and that there's no one he'd rather have by his side. And, and as you know, Andrea, very well, since the moment Joe Biden announced his candidacy a year ago this month, uh, one question that has dogged him uh, since then is why wasn't Obama endorsing him? And the answer he gave on that first day that he gave to me in January that he gave any number of times in between was consistent, which is he needed to show Democrats that he wasn't taking this primary for granted and that he could win it on his own merits. And, and allies of the president, the former president, were also very clear in that there is no one else other than perhaps Michelle Obama in terms of a singular figure in the Democratic Party who could, after what was promising to be with so many candidates, a very bitter and difficult nomination fight, bring the party together at the end of it. And so you see President Obama as part of that very careful, careful choreography that the Biden and the Sanders campaign worked out over the last few weeks, letting Sanders have his day last week to suspend his campaign, then joining arms with Biden yesterday, endorsing him, and now Obama helping to essentially close the deal here. And it was interesting, of course, to hear not just the praise for Bernie Sanders as well from Obama there, but as he talked about Joe Biden and the candidate he is now, he said he has one of the most progressive platforms of any Democrat in our history. And he referred to, not by name, but very notably for people who followed Elizabeth Warren's campaign, to the fact that we can't do anything without big structural change. That was a very important slogan uh, for the Warren campaign and very interesting. And lastly, interesting to note, he never mentions Donald Trump by name, but he refers, of course, uh, to the fact that, he, as he said, there are Republicans both in the White House and in the Senate who are more interested in power than in progress. So careful with his words there as he's now helping uh, to Joe Biden to do what he needs to do at this point, this very critical juncture of his campaign, unite the party behind him for that general election campaign against the president. And Peter Alexander at the White House uh, coming after uh, this was planned, it was taped on Monday, yesterday in his home in Calorama, but coming the day after this extraordinary two hours and 24 minutes from the president just yesterday, uh, arguably one of the worst briefings, if you can call it a briefing because it was all about himself, and this from President Obama's uh, comments on, on his online endorsement. He said, pandemics have a way of cutting through a lot of noise. 
This crisis is a reminder that government matters, good government matters, facts matter, science matters, election matters. Not an exact quote, but uh, pretty close. That is a very pointed reference to what we're seeing at the White House. Exactly. Yeah, you're exactly right. Yesterday's briefing, really more of a show than it was a briefing, focusing much more on the president himself, his handling of this pandemic, than on the deadly pandemic itself. I'm checking my phone as we speak right now because the president's in the Oval Office hosting recovered COVID-19 patients right now. So far, from my understanding, he hasn't yet commented on the president. But in speaking this morning to sources close to President Trump, he says, you know, this is not a shocker, obviously, that President Obama would be endorsing his former vice president. But he says what we should be watching is is not so much his words, but his actions, how much energy President Obama lends to the Biden campaign going forward. In my conversations uh, with people close to former President Barack Obama, they say that he will invest heavily in the Biden campaign. They say they wanted today to be a big rally type event. Obviously, circumstances didn't make that possible. But to, uh, to the separate topic as it relates to the president's comments, and I know we're going to get into this a little bit further, the president really has been going back and forth over the course of this day, Andrew, you saw one of his tweets earlier within the last hour saying, tell the Democrat governors that Mutiny on the Bounty was one of my all-time favorite movies, he says. A good old-fashioned mutiny every now and then is an exciting and invigorating thing to watch, especially when the mutineers need so much from the captain too easy. Of course, some critics were quick to pout. There's that word again. Good old-fashioned mutiny every now and then is an exceptional and investigation thing and vigorous thing to watch, especially when the mutiners, M-U-T-I-N-E-E-R-S, mutiners, I guess that's indicating that it's a hitting of somebody that's trying to form a mutiny. Once more, just because we're trying to look at what's right doesn't necessarily mean that it's some sort of an actual mutiny of somebody trying to take over somebody's position. That's why America is one of the greatest nations in the world. is because we bring things to the table. We bring stuff and we look at different views, we look at different approaches, we look at different opinions. You know, there was a reason why that there was <clears throat> four writers in the Bible pertaining to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There was a reason why. Because one person may have interpreted the actions of Jesus doing one thing in one way, why another person interpreted Jesus' actions in a different way. And if you're a good decipher towards deciphering the Bible correctly, you know, the Bible says to rightly divide the scriptures. But if you're a good decipher, you can look at one person's alignment or opinion about what they heard or what they seen or what they experienced when Jesus was doing what Jesus was doing, in one perspective, and in some areas, their perspective, their perspective, their perspectives line up together. But in other areas, their perspective does not line up together. They claim at any given time that you can take, I think it's uh, up to f seven different people watching an exact wreck happen on an exact corner. And even though they all agree that a wreck happened if you really get down to the pinpoint of who said who hit who first, who hit whose brakes, who swerved, who tried to avoid the accident, who done what, out of those seven opinions, you'll have seven different approaches about what actually happened. Yeah, they all agree that the wreck happened, but they have different opinions about the particulars in how the wreck happened. Because we all have a different mindset to some degree. That's the reason why it's good that we debate things here in America. That way, whenever it's all said and done with, we can choose between the best opinion. You know, if you got three different opinions towards what's supposed to be done, opinion number A, opinion number B, opinion number C, 
you look at all different three opinions and you decipher which opinion do you think would be the best opinion. That's how we as a strategist here in America have become one of the greatest nations in the world. Because we do debate. We do decipher. We do break it down. We do analyze it. We do try to look at the best decision rather than just a decision. And it's not good that we have a leader, Donald Trump, that automatically wants to use these crazy outlandish words, just as this one right here, mute, muteners, muteners. I've never heard of the word mutiners. I've heard of the word mutate, and I've heard of the word mutiny, okay? Mutate is something like a, a disease that mutates. It grows, it evolves, it goes, it, it, it uh, um, basically uh, starts out at one thing, but it mutates into something else. But the word mutiny, mutiny, is where a person or a persons is trying to overthrow somebody like a captain or somebody in charge. I've heard of this word. I know what this word means. But mutiners is a new word. And where in the world did he come up with that word? I guess it's from that movie that he talked about. That uh, was one of my all-time favorite movies. What was the name of it? Mutiny on the Bounty. B-O-U-N-T-Y, Mount Bounty. And I'm sure the word bounty probably means the harbor of a ship. The bounty of, of, uh, of, uh, of a vessel. I'm pretty sure that's what that word means. Bounty. Um... Maybe I need to look at this movie, you know? Maybe that's a possibility that I need to look at this movie and see if I can interpret the same things out of this movie as he did. But it's obvious that this man thinks that he is some sort of a king, that he is basically a figurehead of God to have this kind of power to override what certain governors and certain people in the House, Congress, etc., are doing, how they're doing it, and why they're doing it. I, I think his whole demeanor is all about what the commentator just said. It's about I. I, 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 I. And not about we. It's supposed to be about we. What can we do to make it better? What can we do to not see the second wave? What can we do to make sure that if it happens again, we are properly prepared or better prepared? What can we do if something else occurs that's on this level or maybe even greater pertaining to FEMA? These are not just ideals. These are concepts that we, the people, need to address for our own self-existence. If we are going to exist as a group, as a people, as a country, as a nation, these are things that we need to address, especially in today's society, as we see things unfolding on a bigger, larger scale today than what we ever have imagined that would unveil themselves into. You know, we didn't realize anything as big as 9-11 could or would have occurred until after 9-11 occurred. And we thought after 9-11 occurred, three or four years, five years later, maybe ten years later, well, there's nothing that's going to compass the emergency crisis pertaining to 9-11. Well, guess what? It has. This pandemic has exceeded 
9-11. Many, many fold over. Not just in New York, but throughout the world. This is a global thing. This is a world thing. And if you read the Bible, you'll see where God puts out warnings that not only is this going to occur, but that's going to occur, and this is going to occur, and that's going to occur, and ultimately, in the end, there will be an end. Now, we can either properly, professionally prepare ourselves for these things that has already been selected towards them going to occur. They're going to happen, regardless whether the preacher down the road wants them to happen, regardless whether the politicians in the White House wants them to happen or not, or, or the people in the Pentagon wants them to happen. We can either continue to ignore and be in the state of denial about these things going to occur, or we can start using our heads in prop properly preparing ourselves for the next major event, regardless whether it comes in the form of a microscopic germ, a billionth the size of a human being that can literally tear down a whole community or a whole city or a whole uh, 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 culture of people, or it be a meteor, uh, a comet falling from the sky, or a solar flare that basically burns every electronic device that man has ever created and puts us back into the Stone Age, the Dark Age. We have to be properly prepared for these things if we are going to su survive as a society, regardless whether it be a society over here in America or a society over in Europe or a society in Russia or a society in, in China or, or, or other parts of the world. We're going to have to think ahead if we are going to be survivalist, preppers, those who imagine the ultimate, the, the worst case scenario. And we don't need to look at these people as them being freaks. We don't need to look at these people towards them being unusual, abstract. We don't need to look at these people like they looked at the Davidians towards them being a bunch of weirdos. We need to start working together to where one group isn't trying to outdo the other group. Or we have one state entity pertaining to state government that's competing against another state government. To the point that instead of the respirators costing $25,000, now they cost $32,000 or $38,000 or $42,000. We have to have good leadership. And we have to quit this name calling of mutiners. They're not mutiners, Mr. President. They are people that are trying to do the best in the positions that they hold for the will of the people. We are a democracy. You're going to have to stop this. And you're going to have to be accountable for the things that you should be accountable for. And quit fighting against the truth. This isn't normal politics that we're dealing with here. We're dealing with people's lives. We're dealing with accountability issues. We're dealing with the things that we should have been dealing with all along. Pertaining to survival instincts. Thank you to my viewers. Good luck to all of us. And as we have said, and will continue to say, in 4-14-2020. 4-14. April the 14th. The year 20 and 20. The year of the Jubilee. Shalom.